What is up, everybody? Welcome. So this is already week three of classes. Um, time flies, I guess, when you're having fun. Um, but as I'm sure most of you know, school closures have been extended until May 1st. Um, and that is the earliest that we will go back. Many think, unfortunately, we might not be you know, going back. That's talk throughout the state. However, I hope, and I hope you hope, that we um, see each other before the end of the school year. Um, if not, say hi to me next year. But so this, this week we're gonna be talking about domestic policy. Last week we talked about foreign policy. This week we'll talk about domestic. Uh, we've already talked about domestic in class. Domestic is anything that happens here, happens in the United States. So that is gonna be the subject of today's lesson. So basically just to review, uh, the quiz for this week, you have one lesson tutorial and one mastery quiz. Um, that quiz is worth, ten, well, it's not worth, it's worth 10 points. There are 10 questions. Um, I will be sending out grading criteria instructions in an email to everybody, all right? So let's start this lesson. Let me share my screen. Here we go. All right. <clears throat> so domestic policy. Your objective is you will be able to analyze how domestic policy impacts the United States. It should be pretty easy because that is the purpose of domestic policy, to directly impact the United States. So, <clears throat> um, basically, um, providing health care, building transportation systems, supporting economic growth, these are all ways um, that... Uh, the government can affect normal citizens' lives, all right? Um, so one um, way current events is affecting uh, domestic policy currently is the CARE Act, C-A-R-E. Uh, the CARE Act, President Trump signed into, signed into law a couple weeks ago. That's what um, is going to be giving individuals who are unemployed better benefits, uh, pumping money into our economy, and uh, giving um, individuals who've filed tax returns and are adults um, up to $1,200 checks. Um, that is basically because of the pandemic that we're facing, right, to simulate our economy. But current events, politics, and public opinion shape domestic policy within our country. So we'll skip through that intro video. Um, so the history behind domestic policy. Um, this town it just talks about how um, our public policy and our laws change as America changes. And domestic policy is aimed at fixing America's internal struggles, right? The government makes laws, makes domestic policy or public policy, makes laws that are um, meant to fix issues within the country, to solve problems, internal struggles. And like I said, as the country changes over time, the laws have to change. Laws that were used in 1900 probably aren't very realistic today with all of our technology and um, present way of life, all right? So there are three major, um, you could say, groups or people that influence public policy or domestic policy. The first are elites. The elites, they have, um, they basically exert their, their power um, because they have uh, they control vast resources and wealth. So these are elites like Bill Gates, Mark Zuckerberg, um, Jeff Bezos. These individuals have billions of dollars and they can pay and get what they want. All right. They have power. Money equals power, sadly. Second, we have bureaucrats. Bureaucrats is just another name for government officials. So think of bureaucrats, government officials. They use their political, um, you know, their political uh, physician, so if they're senator, representative, Supreme Court justice, uh, their experience and power to kind of um, direct public policy. And lastly, of interest groups. We talked a lot about interest groups. Interest groups are groups of people that share common interests. So the NRA, the National Rifle Association, they fight for laws that are good for gun owners, that promote gun ownership reduce laws on guns, right? Because they want more freedom with guns. 
So those are the three major groups um, that control public policy within our country. It should make sense. So policy implementation. This is one of those policy making steps that we talked about. So once you know a policy is formulated and it's adopted into law, it has to be implemented. Implemented, based, it's a fancy word, big long word that just means um, put into practice. Right? So it is being made into law, it is being used, it's in our everyday lives. There are four major ways then that the government can get people to follow that new policy or law. The first way is authoritative techniques. These are stiff penalties. So if you drink and drive, you can face a fine, you get your license taken away, and you can go to jail. So those are pretty stiff penalties right, for breaking a law or policy. Remember, policy and law, it's the same thing. An incentive, an incentive. If you get an incentive in any way, that is a benefit for you. Incentives are benefits for you. So for example, um, if you might've heard it's not this way anymore, but when Tesla first came around, the government was giving tax incentives. Basically, if you bought a Tesla, the, the government gave you a tax incentive that saved you money for uh, or with your taxes. So you didn't have to pay as much in taxes if you had a Tesla because it helped the environment. By, help, by getting rid of gasoline-powered cars, we're helping the environment. Capacity. Capacity, I want you to think about education. Capacity, education. Without education, all of us have a low capacity. Education allows us to build our capacity. So if we don't know how to follow a law, the government is responsible for teaching us techniques, training, giving us training to learn techniques to follow that law. Right? We need the, ability, the knowledge to do so. All right? So capacity is building our capacity, expanding our capacity through education, training. And lastly, oratory. Or oratory. These techniques appeal to people's decency and morality um, to follow public policy. Um, so basically, um, don't litter, save our, save our environment, don't litter. That could be a sign that is an oratory technique. Save our environment, don't litter. Or um, the Smokey the Bear, you could be um, only you, only you, only you can prevent forest fires. So don't, you know, leave forest, your, your campfires unattended or smoke in the woods. That can start a fire. Right. So that, um, that is, those are oratory techniques. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Going on. All right. So slide 10 talks about the, the evolution of America's education. It should be pretty obvious, and you probably learned, that in the 1700s, 1600s, when um, our country was founded, education was not like it is today. It was far worse and not very good. Basically, only the rich in the early, early days, were educated. They had the money, the, the means to do so. If you did get educated back then, a lot of it was based on church teachings, but it was also really just focused on making sure you could read and write and do a little bit of basic math, right? We didn't, you weren't learning geometry or trig or chemistry or any of those fancy and um, difficult topics. They were concerned with the basics, but because we want a better society, we learned, hey, we need to make our education system better if we wanna make our lives better, our world better, our society better. Okay. So that's what slide 10 and 11 talk about. Um, so a couple key things that have helped our education system get better in some people's eyes. Um, so 1862, Congress uh, authorized the transfer of federal lands to state governments to build more colleges. All right, so that's one thing. World War II, any World War II veteran, my grandfather was one of those, both my grandfathers, uh, they received the GI Bill. The GI Bill basically allowed returning veterans to go to school 
uh, basically for free. The government footed the bill, covered the bill for them to go to college. That was, you know, an incentive for them, and it really helped a lot of those returning servicemen um, better themselves, better their families, and, and basically create the America we live in today. In 2001, this is controversial. Some people liked the No Child Left Behind Act. Some people hated it, still hate it. So if you look at this gentleman right here, the, the white-haired gentleman on the right, that is actually Ted Kennedy. This is a fun fact. Ted Kennedy is, as you would imagine, JFK's and Bobby Kennedy's brother. Right? He died in 2008, seven years after this bill was passed. But right here, we have George W. Bush. Bush signed the No Child Left Behind Act, which basically made state um, schools use standardized testing more and more and more and more and more to the point where we are today to make sure that schools were doing their job. And yes, there are, there are people that like that and people that do not like that. All right, healthcare. Healthcare, I'm not gonna get super into this, um, but this is um, still being debated, talked about today. Um, after Kennedy, Kennedy was assassinated in 1963, Lyndon Johnson took over and he wanted to create the Great Society. JFK had the New Frontier, but Johnson wanted to create the Great Society. So part of that was providing health care for people, making health care more um, available. He created Medicare and Medicaid, which are both still around today. Medicare provides health care coverage for the elderly. So if you reach seven, uh, I, I don't know what the age is, but um, once you get old, you can get um, government health care. Medicaid, on the other hand, provides health care for in, uh, citizens who are economically disadvantaged, citizens who do not make enough um, and would not be able to have health care on their own. So those are two big parts of the Great Society. Um, Bernie wants health care for all. Um, that's something that the Democrats are talking about. That's something that socialist countries um, are based on, something that we still see in our news every day, and we're, we're going to continue to see in this election cycle. In 2010, um, <clears throat> President Barack Obama, with Joe Biden back here, who's the last remaining Democrat, um, passed the Affordable Care Act. It placed new regulations on insurance companies to protect us. It required Americans to have health insurance or pay a tax. It also provides the government um, subsidy or support for individuals who cannot afford health insurance on their own. So basically, the government will help you get health insurance. The government's making you have health insurance. And the government is watching insurance companies so they don't charge us an arm and a leg. All right, So they don't take over our lives. There are a lot of supporters. There are also a lot of um, critics of this bill. Trump did not like this bill, and he has passed things to take away parts of this bill. All right, energy and the environment. Um, not going to go deep into this because this is something you've seen all the time, right? We have people that think in uh, believe in climate change, and we have individuals who don't believe in climate change. That is the basis for the arguments that um, exist over the um, energy. Um, so up until the 1960s, the United States produced a majority of our oil. 1960, we then went to importing and buying a lot of our energy resources. Um, following a, a U.S. assistance for Israel, right, the Jewish state in the Middle East, um, during the Yom Kippur War, OPEC, or the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries in the Middle East, these are, you know, Saudi Arabia, countries like that, began an oil embargo where they were refusing to send us oil. Therefore, we had to basically shut down parts of our economy and our society like we are right now. Actually, some schools had to be canceled for periods of time in 1973 because there was not enough um, basically gasoline or diesel fuel to power buses or have parents get their kids to school. So we've had times like this before in our history. Um, interest groups, there are interest groups that support oil, coal, and natural gas. There are interest groups that oppose oil, coal, and natural gas. They both fight for, you know, their respective sides. 
obviously coal miners are going to be on or supporting interest groups that favor oil, coal, and natural gas, those fossil fuels. And this was a picture from the 1970s, right? Green, you can go get your gas, yellow flag, only trucks and commercial cars can get gas, and then red, um, no gas at all. So the EPA was, was created in 1970. They basically oversee <clears throat> the environmental status in our country. Basically, they look at companies to make sure they're following emission standards so they're not polluting everything. They look at cars to make sure that there's not too many pollutants coming out of them, um, everything like that. They look at cell phones to make sure we're not getting poisoned by cell phone radiation, 5G radiation. Um, Barack Obama um, put a limit on car companies that they that cars had to average. I don't think this is going to happen, but they had to average 55 miles per gallon by 2025. Five years from now, I do not think that's going to happen because Camaros get like 15 miles a gallon. All right, so that's not most likely going to happen, but hopefully it does. So the EPA basically tries to um, create the best environment as possible within the United States. So social security and welfare, this is a big one. <clears throat> um, so social security was created by FDR as, as a result of um, the Great Depression, increasing the role of the government in the United States. So basically, um, the retirees, once you retire, um, you're supported basically, you get, um, through Medicare and things like that, um, by the the workforce that is currently working. So basically, when you work, you have to pay social security tax. But you work in the in the private private industries. So when you retire, you get money that individuals who are working are paying in taxes. However, there are some issues because our population is shrinking, people are living longer. Those are two big issues for Social Security. So there are, there are a lot of people that don't believe Social Security is going to be able to last, and there are a bunch of people trying to create alternatives to Social Security. As of right now, there are no alternatives. So that is a big issue. Hopefully, we can figure that out by the time a lot of you retire. Um, however, I don't think we're going to have one. We might, hopefully. I'm not going to be negative here. Let's be positive. 2020, positive year. Um, here's a video. Watch the video, please. Uh, welfare programs. You need to know the differences between these two welfare programs. So there are two types. You have means-tested and non-means-tested. All right. Means-tested means a person's income is looked at. So if how much money you make a year, that is factored into what you receive. Non-means tested means that they do not look at your income. Social security, because everybody receives that, is a non-means tested approach because they don't look at your, your, your uh, income. They, everybody gets it, they don't look at your income, that's non-means tested. Now means tested, um, an example of that would be the food stamp program, right? So, if you make $100,000 a year, they're going to look at your income and say, hey, you do not qualify for food stamps or the SNAP program because you make so much money. You can pay for your own food. So um, means tested means they, they look at your income to determine if you get benefits. Non-means tested means that they do not look at your income to see if you um, get benefits. Food stamps is a um, means-based or means-tested um, program. <clears throat> so for this one, basically, you're required to talk about and write about, read this article on about pros from the White House, this, um, and then it's all about the healthcare system. So look at the pros and look at the articles. It's then asking you to list some pros and cons um, that these articles talked about, all right? So you're going to put them in here. This is a pretty good, these are great uh, for your brain. All right, and then your summary. Um, 
All right, we're gonna, I'm just gonna end my screen share. Sorry, welcome back. So in this, we talked about um, around slide 11, we talked about how in slide 10, how the education system has changed. A lot of you right now are struggling with this, with this transition. I'm struggling with this transition to online learning. But we have to continue the process that we started at the beginning of the year. Right? Education is vitally important for all of you. I'm not just saying that because I'm a teacher and that is my job. It truly is. If you think about anybody who has achieved great things, education is something they all have in common. Because if none of us had any schooling or any education, what would we know? Would we be able to write? Probably not. Would we, would be, we be able to count? Probably not. I mean, you could argue that we wouldn't even be able to speak because how would we, we wouldn't have learned a language. So education is vitally important. Um, and one of Joe Rogan's um, jokes was, and I love it because when people complain about education, I tell them this, hey, okay, so you don't want any education. All right, go into the woods, walk into the woods, and all I'm going to give you as you walk into the woods is a hatchet or a knife. How long is it going to take you before you can walk back out of those woods and show me that you develop an iPhone? The gist of that, and Joe Rogan does a better job of telling that joke, but the gist is we're not going to have any of the stuff we have right now, iPhones or anything like that, if we don't have smart people getting a lot of education to make those things. It doesn't come naturally. So education, no matter what you want to do in your life, is something that you need, something that is very important. It's going to help you get to where you want to get. Right? So that's the end of my soapbox. I will see y'all next Monday on this YouTube channel for the next content video. Um, let me know if you have any questions. Email me uh, on my school email or email me through, contact me through Plato. I'll do my best to help you out. Let's have a positive week, people. Seize the day.